um, I would probably ask that if we can continue, if you're on the call, please feel free to navigate and use the chat, chat option to tell us where you're calling from or where you're joining the call from, what country. Um, you can also let us know um, what it is that you hope to gain out of this conversation. So please, um, let's use the chat box while we're doing the conversation. And if you have any questions, um, please do not interrupt the conversation. Feel free to put it in the chat. We're monitoring those. And Kemi and Raf, if there is something that is in the chat box that I might have missed as a result of the my focus on the conversation, please do not hesitate to get them um, to my attention or at least um, at the nearest opportunity please step in and say, hey, you know what, I have this question that um, needs to be attended, okay? Are we good? Yes, we are good. Noted, Prof. Thank you. Awesome. Well, um, I, I just wanted to recognize um, some people here that, um, you know, are calling from different places. We, I see Nigeria, I see Kenya, I see Rwanda. I, I'm not going to mention your names, but you know who you are. Um, so it's good to see um, we have a multinational um, representation. Uh, I think most of my American friends are actually busy right now on Saturday, either barbecuing or doing something that we do in that part of the world. So it's good to see you. Some of you, I see folks like Charles. Um, his name is, he put a different name on here, but I know him. I've not seen him in a very, very long time. Um, I see some politicians. I hope that during this call, you will hear some things to help our people, I beg. <laughs> I'm not mentioning names, but I see you I on the saw, I saw them too, bro. I uh -huh. saw them too. So it I'm just, just saying that I hope that we're all in this journey together. Now, one of the things I want to focus on is um, I, I wanted to talk to you about what it takes to develop a transformative mindset to try to thrive in a difficult time. Now, when we started this conversation at the beginning, or this was actually an impromptu meeting. It was not intended, it was not planned. Um, but when it was brought to my attention that we needed to have a conversation in this topic, um, which was just yesterday, this meeting was actually pulled together just yesterday. And when it was suggested to me, um, I did not hesitate to say yes, because I, I think I have been frustrated mostly because of the sufferings of people. Um, I am Nigerian by birth. Um, I am African by descent. Um, I am American by um, residence and all of those fun stuff that you might want to think of. So God has given me the opportunity or I have been blessed with the opportunity to experience life in a very, very broad term. And I hope that this will be able to help you. Now, so what I'm hoping we can achieve during this conversation is to talk about why do we need transformation? Why do we need that transformative mindset? And then how do we go about navigating it in spite of the challenges that we face every day um, as Africans? Now, some of the things that I will talk about during the course of this conversation is to highlight some of the key challenges that we face as Africans. And what am I talking about? Um, if you've been to places like in, if you've been to East Africa, Central Africa, or even recently in Nigeria, you'll find out there has been a lot of uprising against government inefficiencies, economic hardships, political um, instability, lack of infrastructure, insecurity, the growing divide between the rich and the poor, you know, uh, the resilience and the potential of the youth as a driving force for change. Um, and all across, if you go to places, you hear about conversations around Gen Z and all of these other young folks who are tired, who can basically change their entire experience and their lives simply by owning a cell phone and having data. There is just so much going on. And unfortunately, we also live in a generation where, of, where someone my age I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Some of you know, but some of you don't. Someone my age calls themselves a youth. That is a problem because at my age, I should be thinking about retirement. I should have been thinking about this is my time to run for office. I don't know what office I'm going to be running in, in my 50s or in my 60s or in my 70s or even in my 80s where literally I'll be falling downstairs and will be needing help to even go to the bathroom. 
So when you think about it, it simply means Bashir Inwa. Bashir Inwa, don't let me wrong you. Can catch it live. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of you who don't know, I also speak Hausa. I speak a whole different bunch of languages. So if you, I will meet you halfway. <laughs> All right. So there's a lot of difficulties that we're facing within the context of Africa in itself. And then we also have to embrace the reality of where we are with courage. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that um, here in a few moments. But one thing I, I want to emphasize is that in order for us to thrive, and I know that when we started this conversation about what we want to talk about today, somebody suggested and said, let's talk about surviving. And, and to me, that is not good enough. We don't survive. We were created as humans to thrive. Now, what do I mean by that? It doesn't matter how hard the ground or the earth is. It doesn't matter how hard the environment is. It still has the capacity to produce. Why do I say so? As long as there's a human element at operation, as long as there's a human element involved in any specific environment, it simply means there is the creative genius of God. And I'm using God because I'm a faith person. All right. Whatever you believe, whatever your deity is, whatever your faith is, it's it doesn't matter to me. What I'm saying is I believe in a higher authority. I believe in the concept of divinity having a hand in our creation and our existence. So what that tells me is that if there's a higher power at play that has created me in his, her or its own image, depending on your belief, it simply means that there is a genius at work in me that has the creative ability to produce even when things are difficult. Now, one of the things that has happened in the African context is that a lot of our leaders have intentionally and very systematically weaponized poverty. And when I say weaponizing poverty, what do I mean? It simply means that people have become so short-sighted People have become so short-sighted. What I mean short-sightedness, all they think about is... Ademola, please mute yourself. Thank you, sir. Um, we've become so short-sighted that people are not even thinking about the long-term aspirations or objectives or visions that they have. They are only thinking about what can I get now in order for me to survive. That is why when you go to countries like Uganda, let me pick that for, for an example, there was riots and protests that began in Kenya because the young people and the populace was tired of the fact that they were struggling to make ends meet. They couldn't pay for groceries. They couldn't buy their food. They couldn't pay their children's tuition. There was all kinds of things going on. And so because of that, the young people decided to stand up and say enough is enough. Now, there was some violence and some killings and some things that happened there. Let me just say this to you bluntly. In order for there to be change, and when we're talking about change on a national level, there is going to be sacrifice. There will be bloodshed. There will be losses. And yes, in every situation, there are also going to be bad elements that are going to portray and push for things that aren't right. I'm not supporting violence, but I am supporting the strength of people, especially young people, to stand up and fight for what they believe. Having said that, what happened? In Kenya, they began to stand up and fight with a very clear mandate as to what they wanted. They wanted a tax reform. Ugandans decided to pick up the same thing. Their governors, their leadership literally came out and said, if you try it, we'll kill all of you. And everybody just went home peacefully. <laughs> Similar things happened in Tanzania. Nigerians decided to do the same thing, but their vision was not clear even to me as a Nigerian. Um, it was supposed to be 10 days of protest. I don't know. So, so what did the government do? They literally went back to work, stayed at their home, waited for the people to get off the street and they'll go about their business. Why am I saying all of this? I'm simply saying that there is so much power in each of us, so much power in each of us, that if we harness that power together as a collective, we can create anything. And those are part of the things that I'm hoping we can talk about today so that you can understand that there is so much untapped potential inside of you.
that if you can truly understand the creative genius that exists inside of you, you will not wait for the government to give you handouts. Instead, you are going to take up, pick up the pieces of your life, move on, create something for yourself, no matter how difficult it is. Now, let me give you a simple example from the Bible. Most of us here are Christians. If you're not a Christian, I'm sure your faith talks about the same story, especially since it has to do with the create with the family, the first family we're talking about, Adam and his children. There was a story that said Adam built, I'm sorry, Abraham dug certain wells and during the course of his life or during the course of his demise, some of those wells caused conflict and those wells were covered or were covered back with soil. And the scriptures, I'm talking about the Bible now, which is the faith that I believe in, said that Isaac redug the wells of his fathers. And these were in turbulent, in pestilence, in times of difficulty. And he succeeded, he thrived, he produced while everybody was suffering. Why? The difference was not because he was a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, or because God just had favor on him. No, the difference was very simple. He had a mindset that said, I can succeed no matter where I am. I, I told someone a while back, I said, one of the things about the way I think is that it doesn't matter what country I am in, as long as I have a phone, a laptop, and roof over my head, I can make whatever living I want to make. And I have come to a point where my dependency is never dependent on anybody but myself and also in my abilities. Now, I, I don't want to go too far without, first of all, acknowledging some of the harsh realities that some of you are facing. Um, as a people, I think I see the difference in here. You have to come to a point where you need to face your challenges head on without sugarcoating it. I mean, you have to recognize, first of all, recognizing the problem is the first step towards finding a solution. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You need to recognize that there is a problem. And recognizing the problem and then going to, okay, okay, I, I think I'm going to pause for a second here. Recognizing the problem and then approaching that problem without a clear strategy is void of personal accountability. What do I mean by that? Most of you have heard the term that faith without works is dead. Essentially, I can say, you might have all the faith you need, you might speak all the tongues that you believe, but until you do something about it, your situation will never change. You may be hungry, and there's a restaurant down the street, or there's a bowl of food sitting right in front of you, until you are ready to take on and go sit down and eat that food, you will starve. That is a fact. So how do you change that? You change that by taking on personal accountability. Unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of our people do not believe in standing in and fighting for the long term. I, I have seen this so many times, and I will tell you that it breaks my heart. And when I say it breaks my heart, I mean, how can you take, how can you take 5,000 of your local currency? 5,000, 5,000 shillings, 5,000 francs, 5,000 naira, just 5,000, which amounts to almost nothing for you to vote somebody for the next four for the next four years of office. Or of what value is it that you take just a little bit of ugali or a bowl <laughs> of rice or cassava or something or beans or whatever it is and cast your vote? Your vote is your voice and cast it for someone to literally run your lives. And you know, here's the truth. And since we're saying we're being blunt on this conversation, here is the truth. As long as you receive that 5,000 Naira, 
or shillings or francs or whatever currency or food, material, whatever it is that you receive, you do not have a right to ask for anything else because you've been paid for the next four years. So essentially what that means is that the situation that you're in is something that you have actually accepted by, val by virtue of you being unwilling to have a strategic long-term vision. Instead, you are satisfied with what you can get immediately. And we're talking about immediate gratification, which is one of the biggest challenges and problems we have in Africa. In Africa, we are busy voting people simply because of what they have, not because of what they can do. We're busy, busy voting people into office and dying for people to become our leaders simply because they are kinsmen, not because they have the character, not because they have the capability, not because they have the vision to enable us get to where we need to go to. In the last year and a half, I have had the privilege of crisscrossing Africa as part of my work. And I have seen some amazing, amazing prospects from Rwanda all the way down. I'm talking about from the east of Africa all the way to the west, all the way from Nigeria to Sudan, to Ethiopia, to Rwanda, to Kenya, to, Maurit to Mauritius, to Tanzania. I have seen Africans with brilliant minds ready to do things. And yet we see that the same people are literally enslaved because they have literally mortgaged their future to individuals who do not have any clear vision. And I'm hoping that for some of you who are on this call who are politicians, I truly hope that you will be the key that will open the door for the change that many of our people so desperately desire. So there is a place for personal responsibility that must come into play in order for you to take ownership of your life, despite the external circumstances that are influencing you on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going through this outline clearly so that you can start thinking about some of these things in your own words and in your own way, because we'll start using the latter part of this conversation to go into depth with regards to what are some of the steps that you need to take. But I think it's imperative for me to walk you through what some of the current challenges are. So besides the fact that we have to embrace reality with courage, we also have to take on personal responsibility. The next step I would like to talk to you about is which I might focus most of my time on will be around cultivating a growth mindset. Now, what most of you, if you've not read the book, um, Growth Mindset, I would challenge you to get a copy of that book. It will transform the way you think. Part of the growth mindset is that there are two key elements that you must think about. Number one, what is your perspective? Perspective is very very powerful, meaning that you must move from what is called a fixed mindset into what is determined or called a growth mindset, thereby opening possibilities to who you can become, what you can experience, despite the difficulties and the hardships that you're in. Let me give you a simple example. Somebody is standing in a situation, they might be in debt or they might be in a difficult situation without knowing what to do. Someone with a fixed mindset will easily give up and say, whatever may be, may be. But there is another person that says, I know things are hard, but this is just a phase in that context, what can I do to get myself out of the situation? What can I do differently? What am I not doing right? Or what am I not even doing at all? What are the lessons I'm supposed to learn in this season? As long as there's life, there's hope. As long as the opportunity exists for me to be able to advance, as long as I'm still breathing, I can't give up. That is is the way to think through things. And unfortunately, a lot of people have given up simply because they have a fixed mindset. They see the world as black and white, forgetting that there are gray areas, and they're forgetting that there's also color behind everything besides black and white. It is also important to also learn from your failures. Most of you on this call are at least 20 years old, or averagely, everybody on this call, I'll say we're in our 30s or 40s. What are some of the things that have been 
failure points. I call them failure points because most times we don't like to think about our failures. But the beauty about failure is that it shows you how not to do the thing that caused you pain in the past. Most times people don't learn from those mistakes. So if you think about a nation like Nigeria that is 60 something years old, you think about Kenya that's about the same age, Rwanda probably from 94 or wherever it is, irrespective of what part of the world you're coming from or you're coming from, the question is what are some of the lessons that you have learned nationally, ethnically, individually, or collectively as a generation? What are some of the mistakes you've made? And unfortunately, a lot of times we don't learn from our mistakes. We just keep repeating the same thing and expecting something to change. And if most of you remember this quote by Einstein, it says, it's insanity for us to expect change or something to be different in our outcomes when we keep inputting the same thing. What would you or should you do differently as a result of the mistakes or the pains that you've experienced. One of the beauty about PTN is that we always talk about pain as an agent of change. Now, if something doesn't cause you pain, it doesn't cost you embarrassment, it doesn't cost you discomfort, you will not change. As a matter of fact, you will find yourself comfortable in those situations if you're willing to do something different to, add, to be able to at least come about a different type of outcome. So it is very important for you to learn from those errors, from your past, what you need to learn and grow, rather than sitting down and wallowing around insurmountable obstacles. You know, I, I, I will say this, and, 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 and I hope you will listen to me. Do not make a joke or mockery of your problems. That will not change it. And I'm saying this wholeheartedly. You know, one of the things that frustrates me about Africans is that we joke about people playing with our destinies. For some of us, we just think posting two comments online. Some of us think... Um, Creating memes and mocking the leaders is a solution to the problem. You will wake up one morning and find out that you're 60 years old and some other person has literally stolen your destiny and you did nothing about it because they, you let them do it. For some of you, you will wake up and find out that you're in your 70s and you will complain and wallow about everything and everyone only to find out that the only problem as to why you did not become who you were supposed to become was you. You did nothing about it. It's funny. Oftentimes we want to just dance and laugh, create memes, joke, post and move on. But guess what? Our problems don't go away. They still stay where they are. Now, many of you are wondering, why am I still going on and on and on about this? Because the truth of the matter is that that is the foundation of your problems. And what can the righteous do if the foundation is faulty? If your basis for which you are supposed to be successful, if your way of thinking is wrong, then it does not matter whatever is inputted in you, the outcome is still going to be wrong. <clears throat> The next thing I'll talk about is how do you foster community and collaboration? Talking about oh, building networks. Talking about building networks. You have to understand the importance of community. There is nothing that this generation sets its mind to do that it cannot do if they have the right people thinking the right way, working towards the right vision. Here's what I mean by that. Let me compare two countries, Kenya on one hand, Nigeria on the other. Gen Z in Kenya came out to say, we want a change. We want the tax reform to be dropped. We need X, Y, Z things to be done. There was a very clear articulated list of things that were wanted. These were what I want to call smart demands or smart goals for those of you who like to think about it in that context. It was specific. It's measurable. 
everything about it made sense. It can be achieved, right? There was a timeline to it and they all knew exactly what to expect. Go to the other part of the country where most of you on this call are from. I'm not going to mention what country. You say you're coming out to that you're protesting against bad governance. What is that? What does that even mean? What, what does bad governance mean? It means nothing. It is not measurable. It is not specific. It is very ambiguous. And so guess what your president did? He came out and also gave you an ambiguous speech or whatever it was. And here we are weeks later. Everybody has gone about back to their business and nothing has changed. It's the same old, same old. Why? Because you have not recognized the power of networks. You have not understood the power of community. I mean, once a group of people talking about the populace determined to come together to accomplish anything, there is something that I, I, I don't like to go to, to make reference to scriptures, but I have to in this case. In the Bible, in Genesis, there was a time where a group of people decided to come together and they made a decision. The group of people decided to make a decision that we are going to build a tower from the earth. And that tower is going to be the greatest and best of its kind. And it is going to go all the way into the heavens because we want to go see God. And guess what? The creator of the heavens and the earth said, he said, this thing that they have determined to do cannot be stopped because they are of one mind. The power of community. The power of networks. Most of you want to start a business, but you don't want to partner with anybody else. You by yourself, you want to be the CEO, COO, CMO, CRO. You want to be the chief of everything. And yet your entire enterprise combined, including the shoes you're wearing, are not worth $1,000. Why not seek partnerships? Why not seek opportunities to collaborate with others so that they can bring their diversity, they can bring their skill sets, they can bring all the differences that makes them who they are so that you can become more. But oftentimes we don't understand the collective power that comes with community, collaboration, shared resources, especially when individual efforts are insufficient. There is strength in us being a collective group. So I want to encourage everybody in this group to think about this. At this moment, as I'm thinking about it, who are some of the people that you know that are like-minded? Not just individuals, but groups. Who you can be able to share your vision and join together on this journey of transformation? Because you can never do it by yourself. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is how you can become innovative even with limited resources. You see, most people hear this word resourcefulness, but we don't even understand what it means. Being innovative simply means how you can be able to bring about the little that you have, you have and create something out of necessity and ensure that you can leverage the little that you have in a creative way that it will produce more. One example that easily comes to mind is people always talk about how did Jesus feed the 5,000? Well, we say it's a miracle, but there's a lesson underlying that. That lesson simply means we can do more with less. As a matter of fact, I came to discover, let me tell you, this is a true life story. True life story. In the year 2000, 2000, that is about 24 years ago. My, my income per month, my income, how much money I make in 30 days was $1,308. $1,308. That was in 2000. And here's the beauty. I had a house where I was living. I had a roof over my head. I was not in debt to any human being living or dead. I had a car. I could feed myself. 
I could clothe myself and my kids and my family. We were good. $1,308 per month. Let's fast forward 10 years later, 2010. In 2010, I was making about $20,000 a month. But <laughs> I was owing a lot of debt, credit cards. I was living beyond my means. I could not go on vacation because I could not afford it. So how does somebody who is making $1,308 be, be have everything he needs and be comfortable? And then the same person making $20,000 10 years later is in debt does not have most of the basic things, cannot even afford to go on vacation. Why? The difference is simply this. I was living above my means or I was not content with where I was or I was not thinking creatively enough to maximize what I had. And then 2014 came, I had to sit down and come to myself and have a true conversation and say, oh boy, this is not life. This is not helpful. How can I maximize the little that I have? And I will tell you that between 2000 and 2014 to now, a lot has changed. I'm not going to tell you anything. I'll just tell you that <laughs> things are better than they've ever been. The difference is the mindset. The difference is having a clear, articulated vision. The difference is being content with where you are. The difference is living within your means. The difference is being able to create even in the midst of chaos. The difference is recognizing that there's a genius at work in you, even if everybody around you thinks you're stupid. The difference is that there is something seeking expression that the whole world is desiring to experience, but you have not taken the time to think about it because rather than think, looking inward and expressing outwardly, you have been looking outward and expressing inwardly. What does that mean? It simply means that every one of us is privy to at least three different voices. You are privy to your own voice, you're privy to the voices of those around you, and you're privy to external influences that has nothing to do with you. What am I trying to talk about? It's very simple. The most powerful voice that can create your future is yours. So every time you make a decision, you are the one substituting what others are saying about you as what you should believe. What do I mean? Your mind gives you an idea. Everybody around you tells you that idea will not work. You even go as far as researching it and finding out and reaching the conclusion that, oh, everybody else that tried this has failed. And so you, you, yes, you, you tell yourself, that you will fail, you will not succeed. And guess what you will believe? You don't believe them. You heard what they said. You processed what they said. But at the end of the day, the only reason why you failed was because you told yourself, convinced yourself, and you believed yourself that you will fail. And so you failed. the most powerful voice available to you is your voice. So if that is the case, why do you allow all the external influences to try and shape who you are? It doesn't matter where you go. One of the things I love about the country called Rwanda, and I think I remember one of the speeches that the president Paul Kagame made was that he said, we had gotten so low that we had nowhere else to go but up. 
I think for some of us, in order for us to become successful, we have to reach our wit's end, meaning that you've come to a point where you know there's no way else, there's nothing else that I can do except come out of the situation as a victor. You will face challenges. Those are a consistent part of who we are. You are going to face difficulties. The purpose of this call is not to tell you the five steps that will lead you to become successful. They are for you to discover the you and what's the you is capable of doing. Some of the things that would help you, I think, is that you have to stay resilient. Resiliency has to do with survival. It means no matter what happens, you keep going on. It's that you need to focus on the big picture. You've got to think strategically rather than microly. And what I mean microly, minutely, meaning you. we're so caught up in thinking about today, what we eat, Ah, bro, this country had to, you know, and then the next five minutes, you know, we're dancing to Davido, you know, ah, life is good, oh, just the money to go. Then you wake up in the next morning and find out that your problems haven't even left. As a matter of fact, they become magnified. We are so focused about external influences that we want to become something that we're not even created to be. How many times... Have you tried to pursue things that are not originally who you are? So it is very important for you to sit down and ask yourself, who do I want to become five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now? And let me use this opportunity to say this to many of you. I, I know after I say this, some of you drop from the call and that's okay. Leaving the country is not the answer. It's not. Let me say this to you. If you could not be successful in your own country, you would not be successful in another man's. The difference is that, yes, there might be opportunities over there, but somebody had to pay the price for those opportunities to be created. Somebody had to shed their blood. Somebody had to die. Somebody had to lose everything. People had to be raped. People had to be hung. People had to go through pains, unimaginable things in order for you to enjoy. And then you just want to pack your bag from Niger and Jakba and just go and you think, and people don't even realize this. Do you know how hard it is to live abroad? <laughs> Do you know what it means for you to make $100,000 and the government will collect 30K off the top without you even arguing? And if you don't pay, they will now come and arrest you for tax evasion. <laughs> do you know that if you make that amount of money, do you know how much it is to pay rent or to pay your mortgage? Do you know how much gas, gasoline costs you? Do you know how much it costs you to buy furniture? Do you know how much your living expenses are a month? Do you know one of the things I love about traveling to Africa? I can come to Africa and I'll spend and I'll stay an entire month and I'll not spend up to two or three thousand dollars and I'm living comfortably, being able to do anything and everything I want to do. But guess what? That alone cannot even pay your rent in America, at least a decent home. You're not talking about food. You're not talking about your transportation. You're not talking about your health insurance. You're not talking about, bro, <laughs> Jakba is not the solution. Because you can go abroad with the same mindset and you will suffer. Ah, I mean, I mean, when we talk about suffer, you know, there's a suffer that looks, there's, you know, there's an emphasis on far. There's suffering and then there's suffering. <laughs> By the time you're done, even the people at home will say, ah, bro, come back, we'll take care of you. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say? What needs to change really it's your mindset. You have to have a clear long-term vision and you have to stay with that vision. And that is where resiliency comes into play. That is where staying with the, with the grunt of it matters. So let me talk to you quickly about five things that you must do to develop a mindset. Now, I've talked about all the problems. We've touched about all the different things. We've bitten around the bush and everything. But here's a few things that you must do. Number one. The first mindset issue that you need to resolve is what I call fatalism and hopelessness or helplessness, depends on how you see it. 
Shift from believing that circumstances will never change. You must shift from that mindset and come to a place of understanding that change is possible if you are persistent, no matter what it is. Be it in the system, be it in your business, be it in your family. As long as you can change the way you think that it is possible for things to become better. Change, transformation begins from within. In that same context, the second thing that you need to do is that you need to focus on what you can control. You need to focus on what you can control. What are the things and where are the opportunities that you can make a difference rather than feeling overwhelmed by the bigger issues? Let me give you a simple example. There was a time where I determined I was going to come to Nigeria. I was going to run for office. I was going to join politics. We're going to change the country. We're going to... Well, and somebody just called me one morning and said, hey, bro, you want to die? I said, no, you know, this nation needs, uh, by the time I started talking, I just realized that I can't change this by myself. I, the system is innately corrupt to a degree that an individual or a small set of individuals cannot change it. So what do I do? I rather focus on the things that I have the power to change. Who are those in government that I have the opportunity to influence? Like some of you on this call are some of my protégés and your politicians. You have influence and I've seen some of the amazing work that they're doing. Some of you on this call, I'm not going to mention your names, are busy building infrastructure in your local communities. That has not happened in 63 years. That is transformative. It's not just providing food. We all know this concept that if you give me fish, I might be fed. But if you teach me how to fish, I will never go hungry. What are we doing? What is in your power to control? And so as a result of that, rather than trying to change the entire country that I know most likely will not happen during my lifetime, I focus on changing the minds of individuals like you who I know have influence in specific domains of the society and you are now bringing that change. So it's beautiful for me to come on a call like this and hear somebody say, oh, I am a student or a mentee of RAF. I'm a student or a mentee of um, Fumi. I'm a student or a mentee of this person or that person of Kemi of that person. Or... It's beautiful, you know, because it tells me that my effort has not been in vain because I am seeing the product, the outcome the fruit of the labor of years and years of pouring into most of you, most of the time at my own expense. The second thing you have to do is you need, to, the second mindset issue you need to address is the issue of dependency on external solutions. What does that mean? You must become self-reliant. You must cultivate a mindset of self-reliance and resourcefulness, focusing on finding solutions within yourself or the community rather than waiting for the government or for, for bats to solve your problem for you. And whining about external things will not change it. You sit down all the day, all day by the rivers of Babylon. You're complaining about Ruto, you're complaining about Tinubu, you're complaining about everybody that you can complain about. Complaining, first of all, your complaint does not even get to them where they are in their presidential palaces. What can you do to solve that problem? What resources abide within you that you can bring into bear? Secondly, you have to start thinking innovatively, meaning you have to encourage creativity and out-of-the-box thinking as tools to overcome challenges with the limited resources you have. Somebody asked me that, why do I love it so much? Why do I love investing in Africa, investing or investing or spending time developing people in Africa that much? I said, it's very simple because I can take $200 in America and go to dinner and have lunch and I'm done. And that money ends up in the toilet a few hours later. But that same 200 in the hands of a well-informed African can start a business that will not only send their kids to school, but will also take care of the generations yet unborn with the right education, the right mindset, the right transformative agenda at play. 
Thirdly, under the second the issue of um, the mindset is you have to understand that collective action has benefits. Where possible, work with other individuals to solve common problems, thereby reducing dependency on government and other issues like that. Let me give you a simple example. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say you want to buy a bus one of these vans, bus for transportation, and that bus is going to cost you five million. Five million, okay? And you only have one million. Or let's say you even have 500k. Let's just call it what it is. But you know five other people that have one million each. And you're all trying to buy the same bus. <laughs> but you don't have money. Some of you are thinking, oh, I'll go to the bank and take a loan. At the loan, I have bankers on this call. I can put some of them to tell you. In fact, let me just ask this question. Somebody just, one of the bankers on this call, just tell us if somebody comes to your bank and says they want to take a 5 million naira loan or 5 million shilling loan, what is the interest loan interest rate that your bank is going to charge them? Please put it in the, in the chat just for them to know. Or if you work in a bank or you've worked in a bank or you have an idea, what is the interest rate? Now, while they are doing that, think about this. Five of you with one million each, why can't you bring your five, your one million each together and buy the same bus and start sharing on the profit? There's nothing wrong with that. Because the million that you each put into that vehicle is principal. You take care of it collectively as a collective or a communal resource. And at the end of the day, you share the profit or you build collectively. It's almost like you have an enterprise or you have a business valued at 5 million and you are 20% owner of equity in that business. But instead, you will spend the next five months, the next one year complaining about how the economy is bad and how you can't 27%, Jesus is Lord, 27%. But if you know, if you all put your money together and get that 5 million business started, if it bothers you so much, incorporate the business, but you're saving yourself 27% interest rate that you're going to be paying to the government, I mean, to the bank. And so you will never break even in that business, even in the next five years. The power of networks, the power of community. The third issue, talking about the my third mindset issue is the fear of failure. The fear of failure. So if you remember, I said the first mindset issue is fatalism and a sense of hopelessness. The second mindset issue is dependency on external solutions. And then the third mindset issue is fear of failure. You must always embrace failure as an opportunity for learning. I always call it fail fast and so that you can move on to do it right. You must redefine failure as a step towards growth and learning. You have to become focused on resilience and persistence after every setback. You don't see a child walking and that child falls down and that child stays on the ground and says, I am never going to walk again. No, they cry, they pick up and they start all over again. The same thing, I remember teaching my daughter how to, my daughters how to ride a bike. Many times they will fall down. Many times they will scrape their elbows. They will scrape their knees. They will hit their head. But guess what? They pick up. They're crying. We start again and we move on. At some point, you turn around and you see them just riding by themselves. And you're wondering, how did all that happen? Persistence, resilience, consistency, and a never giving up attitude. That is what is important. Number two, talking about fear of failure, you have to take risks. You have to take calculated risks as progress often requires stepping out of your comfort zone. If you think you're going to become successful simply by staying within your comfort zone, I will see you in the year 2037 in the same condition, if not worse. Why? Because success requires moving out of your comfort zone. As a matter of fact, you must become comfortable with being uncomfortable in order for you to become successful. 
Let me say that again. You must become comfortable with being uncomfortable in order for you to become successful, meaning you must be ready to take on risks and do things that you've not done before. The third piece about fear of failure is that you must share your success stories. Let the world hear about it. Present examples of things that you've done and how you overcame failure. One of the things that I love doing on calls like this, I like to bring people to tell, let them tell us where they were five years ago or 10 years ago or where they were seven years ago. I have so many examples on this call. I remember people who, I remember somebody on this call, I'm not going to mention their name, who was on one of my sessions at that point, like just at the point of trying to decide, should I continue with my banking career or should I go do the thing that I'm passionate about? And as soon as that 36 hour training was done, this person decided to say, I'll, I'll quit banking. I'm going to do what I love to do. And today, this person is thriving and doing well. As a matter of fact, I'm excited because one of the things that excites me about this individual is that the trainings that I'm supposed to be doing every day for everyday people who I believe will not understand half the thing I'm saying, she's the one doing that and going to places that I otherwise would not have gone to. So I can focus more on training the trainers. The fourth mindset issue you need to think about is short-term thinking. <laughs> I have never in my entire existence as a human being seen any group of individuals that have such a short attention span. Like, I, when I say short attention span, it is very disturbing. Do you know what? Some of your governments, all they have to do is to distract you is you'll be talking about something important and the next day they'll just tell you, hey, palliative, we're giving free food. And many of you will rush there and that's the end of that problem. And you start talking about the food and you just forget. And that was one of the things that inspired me because I remember when I said I was coming to, to run for office in Nigeria and be part of the change and all of that, and somebody just said, bro, you die for nothing. I said, yes, if I die, I die, no problem. He said, ah, you die. For the first few weeks, they will be posting, ah, we will never forget. <laughs> Hashtag, Dala lives on. <laughs> Give them three weeks, one month. In fact, by the next year, you'll find out that out of the 100 people that said they will never forget, maybe about 10 people will still remember. By the second year, maybe one person will remember. By the third year, nobody will even remember that you even existed. I said, ah, oh, in that case, I better stay and live long so that I can take care of my children and pursue my own vision and dreams and desires. Short memory, short attention. So it is important for you to start laying out long-term goals that go beyond just surviving. You need to focus on sustainable growth. You need to focus on your development. You need to get past immediate gratification. We are so interested in immediate gratification. It gets on my nerves. We just want what we can eat, what we can see, what we can touch right now. What about taking the time to invest and plan and build so that five, 10 years from now, the fruits that you, the seeds that you planted a year ago will begin to produce. You see, when you plant corn, by this time next year, the corn is done and it's gone. Most times, biannual crops produced by the second year, they're done, they're done. The annual crops, they're done. But when you plant an orchard, some of those things, Janet and Juan, could you please mute your line? Some of those things take years to grow. And during the course of that time, it grows and then it produces consistently year in, year out, night or day, summer or winter. It is producing. Why? Because you are thinking long-term strategically. You are not thinking immediate gratification. That's why if, if you're not thinking immediate, why would anybody come and give you 5,000 for your vote? What kind, of, what, what kind of an insult is that? Do the math. 5,000 divided by what? You have 365 days in a year. Multiply that by four. You're talking about 1,440 days. Divide that by 5,000. Roughly, they are paying you about three. Three, like that. 
three units of your currency for your life. That is, what can you buy with three naira per day? What can you buy with three shillings per day? Think about what I'm saying. Because we cannot think long term. Most of your leaders that are said they are leading the youth to fight, once they get settled, they leave you hanging in the streets. Why? Because they are more focused on immediate gratification. But you have to start thinking, if I suffer now, I know that there's benefit on the long term because you're thinking strategically. You've got to strategically plan, create actionable plans that align with your long-term vision. Let me ask you this question. Who do you want to become when you grow up? You have to learn how to break down those large goals into small actionable steps that you can pursue every single day. It doesn't matter if it is financial, it is educational, it is personal development. There is a degree of sacrifice that must come into play in order for you to start taking those manageable steps one after the other, left here, right there, two steps to the right, two, three steps to the left, and you will get there. It does not happen overnight. And let me tell you something, becoming a millionaire is not your problem because every one of you on this call, I guarantee you today is a millionaire somewhere. All you have to do is to take the little that you have and go to Zimbabwe. In fact, for some of you, you're billionaires. Think strategically. To the fifth mindset issue, neglect of your personal well-being. So many of you are so focused on what is happening around you that you don't even pay attention to take care of yourself. I'm talking about your mental and physical health. You are stressed. You don't even bother to take care of yourself. We're talking about your health. You're not taking care of your physical well-being in challenging times. In these challenging times, what will be what you need more is peace of mind. Peace of mind. You must be mindful. You must be pay attention. Um, Olua Shegun. Oh, good, good. Thank you. You must be very mindful of your peace. You have to think about things that will help you become mindful of your well-being, your mental states. You have to, diff everybody is different. Let me tell you what I do. There are certain things that I cannot compromise on. I cannot compromise on my peace of mind, no matter what the profit is. No matter what the profit is. I cannot compromise on my peace of mind. If the situation gives me unrest, I would rather walk away. If it is in a relationship, if I am feeling stressed by being around a person, around a group of people, I will exclude myself, no matter what the reward might be. Why? Because there is nothing that is profitable when you are in the grave. No matter what you're pursuing, if you were to fall down and die, it's over. So what are we fighting for if we're not even healthy? The biggest investment you can make is in your health. How can you take care of yourself? Number one, find peace by all means. Number two, exercise. And I'm going to say this. Number three, eat right. Let me explain this. For most of my Nigerian people on this call. Just because you can eat a mountain of food and meat. Does not mean that you should. It is not a sign of enjoyment, prosperity or success. As a matter of fact, when you see people eating like that, it is a sign of poverty. Because why? Do, how can only you one human being sit down and eat a bowl full of food and meat, literally overflowing from this? And you are saying this is the life. The life of what? The life of a man about to die. Do you know what that is doing to your body? Do you know what that is doing to your health? Do you know what that is doing to your sis? I mean, it. 
It's, it's insane. Moderation is the key to success in anything. Choose to eat right. Choose to eat healthy. I have a very, very, very good friend of mine. I'm not going to mention his name, but I will tell you that he lives in Kaduna, Nigeria. <laughs> very good friend of mine. I love that man to death. <laughs> but every time we spend time together, I am reminded of how far God has brought me. Think about this. Like when you as a male or as an African man thinks your wife is insulting you because she provided you, she made you salad. Like what kind of thing is this? Do I look like a goat? No. It's for your own health and for your own well-being. There's a reason why women live longer than men. Because apart from the fact that we're careless and we don't pay attention, the fact of the matter is that they are very careful about what they eat, especially as they grow older. But we think that at the age of 65, we can still move that mountain. And then you're wondering why you're walking around sluggish and feeling as if you're nine months pregnant, even though you don't have a baby inside of you. The older you get, the more important your health becomes. So for those of you who are still young, energetic, and thriving, let me just tell you this, it's not going to last forever. So I want to encourage you, get your butt in the gym. The reason why you're working out 30 minutes, one hour every day, it's not because you want to look hot and so that everybody would think, ah, yeah, see, bro, I said, bro, just your muscles just they come out. Dude. No, it's not that. It's because you want to live long. And as long as you are alive, your mind is functional, your brain is working, your creative genius is still at work, guess what? There is no environment that you're in that you will not thrive in. Why? Because vitality, creativity are all keys in order for you to thrive and be successful in any environment that you find yourself in. And this is very, very important for me to say as the last point, talking about neglecting your personal well-being. Balance and boundaries. You must learn how to set boundaries. Hmm. <sighs> learn how to say no and not feel guilty. It is okay to say not now. It is okay to say, I cannot. It is very okay to say, I don't have. Who are you trying to impress? Many of you will get in debt trying to help your family members and your friends because you're trying to impress them rather than help them. To what end? Live within your means, set boundaries, just because you cannot afford a $5,000 vacation does not mean that you cannot afford a 5000 naira one. You see everybody going to Dubai, to the Maldives, to Europe and all these places and flexing and posting and blah, blah, blah. You're like, ah, this is the life. Don't stress yourself. If all you can do is go from Kaduna to Abuja on the weekend, bro, that is your vacation. If what you can do is leave Nairobi and go to Mombasa for the weekend, that is your vacation. Even if you can't do that, if all you can do is to get an Airbnb somewhere in town and go and flex with two of your friends and hang out and all you can afford that weekend is Indomie. As long as you're away from your natural environment, that is your vacation. If what you can afford is go pay to go hang out at a pool all afternoon on a Saturday, that is your vacation. It does not have to be something fancy. Listen, there was a time when I was traveling economy at the back of the cheapest flight I could find. And there was a time when I could afford to travel first class on the best airlines available. But everything takes time. Let everybody cut their coat according to their cloth, not your size. Live within your means. No matter how wealthy you are, you must understand the concept of boundaries. It is okay to say no. So before we wrap up, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask questions. I know we're well over our time, but 
where are you rushing to to the same problem that you've not been able to solve so bro my sister don't be annoyed calm down okay i respect your time but i think it's important for us to have this conversation so remember five key mindset issues that you must address number one fatalism and feeling hopeless you are not you can change all of that number two depending on external solutions the answer to your future, the answer to changing everything begins with and within you. Dependency, number two, dependency, Kemi, I see right and dependency on external solutions. Number three, mindset issue you need to resolve is the fear of failure. Failure is what you tell yourself. Failure is what you don't learn from. Failure is taking risks that are not calculated. Failure is what becomes when you fail to take alternative solutions. Number four, mindset issue is short-term thinking. Short-term thinking. Short-term thinking. You must think strategically. You must think long-term. You must have a vision and a plan for your future. And that is not just thinking it. You've got to start taking calculated steps towards it. And the last thing is the neglect of your personal well-being the neglect of your personal well-being. These five mindset issues are things that you must address. So I know I've rambled across for the last hour because I started at 8.15 very intentionally. And here we are at about a quarter or 20 minutes past. We could end the call, but I also want to give you the opportunity to ask questions and allow me to address more specific things if you want to talk about it. So at this point, I am just going to hand it over to Fumi. Fumi, I say Fumi Kemi, <laughs> um, since she's our host on this call. If you have any questions, I would love to take your questions. If you're too shy to come on call and speak, feel free to post them in the chat. We'll take it from there. But if you're coming on to ask questions, make sure that you actually come on camera so that we can see you. Kemi. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Prof. I was so excited. I was looking at the time. I said, Prof, really have time for us? You guys are supposed to be one hour. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I'm sure we've had a good time because of our time so that people can ask questions. I have my own question, Prof. Uh, no, 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 it doesn't work. Like that. Your question oh, is just... <laughs> Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Thank you so much, Prof. And I, I did a recap. If you can look at the chat, you'll see some recap there that I did for some of us that joined late. So do we have anyone that have question yet? Before I start, I saw somebody come on video now. Unfortunately, I can just see Galaxy Tab A. I can't see your name. So if you have any question, please, this will be the time to unmute and ask, ask your question in just 10, 15 seconds. So Prof, we have time to answer. Yes. Oh, Galaxy A, is that Tonya? That looks like Tonya to me. Yeah, it looks like Tonya to me too. Tonya, unmute and ask a question if that's you. Galaxy Tab. Hello. Yeah, good yes, evening, everyone. Oh, yeah, it's Tonya. Hello, thank you. Hello. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Doctor, thank you for this session you are putting in place. Um, I heard you talk about uh, networking and uh, how good networking are. But the very challenge you have in Nigeria, doctor, I don't know if I will call you great. Uh, sometimes when you have the mindset to network with people across the country who do the same profession that you do, sometimes or uh, majority of the time they circumvent the process. Circumventing the process meaning that you have your client and probably because of maybe distance, you are not be able to get to maybe Lagos, Abuja, Kaduna, and you get a folk there that does the same job with you and uh, trying to ask for support service, for them to give you a support service, they will go behind you and take the job. It has happened severally, and that I find out that this networking is not working fully. So what do you want to do? Most times you might not be everywhere, but you want, you want to deal with people of your like mind. But when you think that the people that you are dealing with are responsible, Unfortunately, those who you think that they're responsible are irresponsible too when it comes to money and also dealing. So I want you to advise me on what to do about that. So let me ask you this question. What do you think is the problem with those people? What do you think is the problem? 
well, uh, sometimes when you have your when you have your vast clients in uh, based on your network and your experience you have built over the years, and uh, with time you might not be able to meet up all the client demand. So most times you want to shift most of the most of your responsibility to your colleague, who you know that can solve the problem for you. Okay, either so, by so, your so. own supervision. Let, let, let me cut but you sometimes short. for the benefit of time let me cut you short i apologize for for stepping in but I, I i i hear what you're saying um but let me answer you real quick for the benefit of everybody else on the call when we talk about creating networks we're not just talking about trying to build you know partnerships with just anybody it's not everybody that can partner with you if you're developing partnerships you've got to think about people of like mind and like mind actually means people who can bring complementing resources to what you do we are not talking about people who replicate exactly what you're doing because here's the thing dala is so unique that it doesn't matter where you go on earth there's nobody that speaks like me thinks like me works like me operates like me and delivers like me there's a uniqueness about who i am just like my fingerprint but Dala cannot do everything. And so the beauty about you being who you are simply means that you must come into a network and partnership with individuals who complement your capabilities so that your one becomes three when you bring your one together. What I mean by one becomes three, because if you, if you bring 1,000 to the table and somebody else brings 1,000, collectively you have 3,000. And you might not understand it because that math does not make sense. But if you have... If you're thinking, if you're an A-type thinker, you now go and bring another A-type thinker. Why should somebody else that you're trying to service prefer you over the other? There is nothing unique about your service. So when we talk about, let me just say this to you now. Like it or don't like it. Get off the call if you want, if you don't know me. What that I'm simply trying to say is that Africans are greedy by nature. I'm an African too. But we've got to change that mindset. Why, are, why do I say Africans are greedy by nature? Because poverty has become so weaponized by our leaders that we think greed at all times. All we think about is how can I sidestep the other person? That becomes who we are. But you can change that, number one, by educating, by empowering, by showing through your own actions, your own values, and your own leadership that there is something different about you. Here's the crazy thing. Let me give you a simple example, Mr. Yala, since you're the one asking this question. I entrusted you, you're on this call. I entrusted you and two other people within your circle, my network, to build a house for my mother. True or false? True. Did I ask you to come back and account to me how you spent the money? No, no, no. I never did. Why? Because I could trust you. If you said you needed a million, I sent it to you. You needed two million, I sent it to you. Why? And even when I didn't ask for it, you came back and accounted to me everything that you spent. And today, that woman is living in that beautiful facility. I was never there until it was completed. Why? Because I have instilled my values in you over time. How do you do that? Identifying people of like minds simply means seeing people's potentials, seeing their vision, knowing their hunger, seeing where they're going, and knowing that I and this person can merge. No matter how good you are, water and metal can never walk together. Oil in water will always separate after a period of time. So when we talk about networking, it's not just identifying people haphazardly. It's identifying people who you can enter into true lasting partnerships with in order for you to become the very best that you can be. Mm. It doesn't matter if the person is wealthy or poor. It doesn't matter if the person is at your level or not. As long as they have the potential, start building that relationship. And networks takes time, sir. It's not overnight. Don't 
put your pearls on swine, particularly one that looks like a fox. That's all I can say. Next question. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. I, I personally like the last statement. Don't put your pearl on swines, especially the one that looks like fox. Okay, we have a question from Precious in Fine. She said, um, could having multiple alternative solutions be considered as fear of failure? If I get the question correctly, maybe he's trying to say, having plan A, B, C, D to Z, maybe that's what he's saying. Can, we, can, can Precious come and clarify what they're saying? Because even I don't understand that question. All right. Oh, Precious, if you are still on the call, do you mind clarifying? While we are with Precious, any other one that has a question can please um, come up quickly because of our time. Okay. Okay, yes, Precious says yes. So it's having, having multiple There is nothing wrong with having multiple plans, Precious. Nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, those of you who know me or for those of you who have ever attended what we call our PTN, Private Transformation Network training, you'll find out that one of the things that we encourage you to do is to have a plan A, plan B, plan C, at least three depths of plans. That is not a fear of failure. That is knowing that you will fail or providing contingencies or alternate paths when that happens. Plan A is always where your best and your brightest would be, but you also have in mind that in case that derails, I have something that will keep me moving. So there is nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, having alternate plans is a solution to the fear of failure. And you must never be afraid of failure. Failure is a part of success. I hope that answers your question. Hopefully. Uh, okay, yeah, said it did. Okay, any other question, please? Can you just um, indicate by show of hands so that we can get to you quickly because of our time? Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, how does one manage the... Can we go Sorry, ahead and ask your question? Okay, my own question is you posted something in the chat. There is a yacht there. And um, the act says your mindset is either the sail or the anchor. Could you explain a little more about that, please? Part of the reason why I put that is just a, a something to think about and visualize. The mindset works in one of two ways. When you think about a growth mindset or a possibility mindset, you're talking about the sail because it moves you forward. The purpose of a sail on a boat is to give you acceleration, to give you speed. It literally engulfs the wind and causes you to traction and motion and progress. Whereas the anchor is to keep you stagnant and keep you in one spot. Let me tell you a story. In a few years ago, I, I took my family out um, on, <laughs> we went out on vacation and we decided to rent a boat and just spend the whole day on the water. And we wanted to go, um, you know, spending some time in the lake. It was a beautiful lake of the Ozarks. We wanted to just hang out there in the middle of nowhere and just stop the boat and come out and do some Paris and what's it called? Like some board surfing and all of that fun stuff. But as I stopped the boat, because I, you rent the boat, you take it and you go. And I noticed the boat kept moving. And I was looking everywhere for the anchor. I couldn't find it. I did not, it was one of those new fancy boats that I didn't know that the anchor was this mechanized thing inside this place. You have to push a button to release it. So half the time, the boat was moving all over the place. <laughs> it, was, it was like, it made no sense. We couldn't jump in the water. We couldn't do anything because the anchor was not there. Instead, as the wind was blowing, the waves kept moving the boat. That's what happens when you don't have an anchor. Once you are free of your anchor, which is the things that stop you from progressing or moving, you will naturally begin to move, much less when you have a sail that is intended to take advantage of the wind. Does that make sense? So are there things holding you back? The things holding you back are some of the five mindset issues that we talked about. Now, what will you do differently? First of all, you change the mindset by bringing the anchor on board, I'm not saying those things are ever going to go away. They're never going to go away. They're part of who you are. But you can have the anchor raised so that you can leverage the wind and start moving forward. So that's what that is. Does that make sense to you, Kemi? 
Absolutely. Okay. Bring the anchor on board. Always. <laughs> okay. Okay. I was just thinking about it. That. All right. Okay. There's a question out there. Can you review that? Yes. How does one manage the uncertainty of the environment? Example, buying and giving a vehicle out to someone to manage. Some environmental killers are police, LASMA, area boys, bad boys, etc. Investment in an organization and the owner disappeared with the fund with the help of the system. This is a Lagosian asking this question. I well, guess. What do we do? <laughs> <sighs> um... <laughs> You know, um, in different parts of the world, in different parts of the world, there are systems that safeguard what you do. I have, as recent as a few years ago, invested as much as $243,000 in a business and the person just disappeared in America. 246000 sorry. And the person just disappeared. And I will spend more money in court trying to retrieve my money back. So what do you do? You've got to make a choice. Do you want to fight or not? But when you go to a place where the system does not work or the system is part of your problem. Here's a simple example. Another, another example. Of about last year, I was traveling to Kenya, to Nairobi. And I booked an Airbnb on booking.com. With booking.com, oftentimes you pay when you arrive. And this person, I saw this beautiful facility that made sense, blah, blah, blah. The owner contacted me and all of that. I said, yeah, sure. So I went ahead. I said, well, you know, we need you to make a down deposit before you arrive. I said, no problem. So I went ahead and I made the deposit. I think it was a deposit of about $140 or thereabouts, something insignificant. Only for me to arrive around... One o'clock in the morning, I did not have a phone. I did not have anything. Thank God one of my friends came to pick me up at the airport. We only, we got to the facility and when we got to the building, they say, oh, welcome, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so I said, I'm in my, I'm going to apartment, apartment seven, something or six, whatever it is. And the person said that apartment does not exist in this building. At the end of the day, I was told to file a police report. And here's the thing about the police report. For me to file a police report and get them to start investigating, I have to pay. And I'm actually going to be paying more than I have lost to try and retrieve $140. So instead, I just said they can keep them. $140 will not change their lives. Do you understand? Thankfully, that night, I've, we, you know, I found a place to sleep. And then the next day, I sorted myself out. What am I trying to say? You've got to understand the system. And what I did was that everything, both in the business that I invested in in America, the experience that I had changed everything. So one of the decisions that I made was that if I'm ever coming to a place, I have to get to the place, check in first before I pay. If I'm not doing that, Jesus is Lord. Or if at all I'm going to be paying, I'm going to be paying through a system that guarantees. So now I can, I can pay for anything through Airbnb directly. And show up. And if it doesn't exist, I'll call Airbnb and Airbnb will return my money. It's not like I paid to an individual account. You have to understand the environment in which you operate and you have to come up with systems that protect your interest. Now, if you have a vehicle to your question, Agbadu, which is I have a more transportation, you've got to factor all of those things in. Unfortunately, your country or the city you live in does not protect the interest of the people. As a matter of fact, you have to remember that people like Lasma, and I'm assuming that Lagos will Lagos, you know, Transport Management Authority or something like that. I know even though they are a government facility, but they are really area boys collecting money for some politicians. That's how they raise their capital. We all know that. So what do you do? You do you just sometimes you just got to go with the system and do what you've got to do. And let me give a simple example here. I, I do business. I, I'm a businessman. I'm a technologist. Um, I consider myself a person of integrity, but I also do business with people who I cannot say the same about them. But here's what I've come to learn, sir. If you truly want to change people, you want to change systems, you want to change society, 
you must be willing to pay a price. There was a time, there's somebody on this call, Mr. Namiji. We were working on a project one time with a state government. And from that project, we were going to be making a profit. We were, when I say we, I'm talking about a collective group. After everything was done, we were going to be making a profit of about $1.4 million per year. It was a good deal. As a matter of fact, when I was brought in as a consultant to work on that project, part of what I determined to do was to deliver the products better, better quality, higher grade, lower prices, and make more profit. And everything was good to go. But there were people in the system that says, in fact, they told me straight up, first of all, what that means is, hey, do you want this thing or not? Meaning you have to settle them, otherwise you are not going to make progress. So here's the philosophy that I now picked up doing business with government. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to the Lord what is the Lord's. Otherwise, you just walk away. It's a choice because some of those people, I call them principalities and they will never leave and they will never settle. So what do you do? If our agreement is that we are going to deliver an iPhone 15, then we are going to deliver nothing less than an iPhone 15. Why? You can charge, you can, you can say this iPhone 15 is 200,000. I don't care. As long as we deliver an iPhone 15, you can justify why it's 200,000 while we all know that it was 100,000. But we cannot deliver some random no-name phone or an iPhone 6 for 200,000 or, or even worse, deliver nothing and still claim we delivered an iPhone 15 for 200,000. That is robbery. But the, the rules and the, and the governance around capitalism means you can charge anything, whatever price you want, as long as you deliver it with quality, quantity, and it meets every control price that is required of it. So, Agbadu, you've got to figure out this by yourself. You've got to think about this. I have a system. How does this work? You've got to marginalize your profit or at the end of the day, I, I don't know. The Nigerian problem is very complex for me. My mind sometimes does not understand it. But all you can do is factor in all of those things. And at the end of the day, if it makes sense, continue the business. Make sure you give to Caesar what Caesar's and to the Lord what is the Lord's and keep hoping and praying and pushing good people into those systems. If not... Maybe it's time to just sell that vehicle and try a whole different business that will give you less stress and peace of mind. Does that answer your question? I, I just wanted to give you the whole different examples. I'm not sure if that makes any sense to you. Hmm. Nigeria. <laughs> it's not only a Nigerian problem. It's, it's, it happens everywhere in the world, but it's just very, very predominant in African nations. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate yeah. because I've been, I've done work and I travel to places like Rwanda. As a matter of fact, as a public official, if you ask for a bribe in Rwanda, you go to jail. Hmm? You go to jail as a public official. In fact, you can't, it wouldn't even cross your mind to bribe somebody. And so it's not an African problem. <laughs> it's not, right. a, it's not an African Thank you, Prof. Okay, I saw someone's hand. Wait, please, can you unmute and ask your question? Samsung SMA145. I'm sorry, I can't get your name. Can you unmute and ask your question, please? I see your hand raised. Oh, Victor. Victor. You're welcome. Finally, you're able to come in. All right. I have to use the back. I have to. I have to use the roof since I. I I thought I thought you were speaking at an event tonight. I saw a post. Don't come in with the door and window. Let me use. I thought I saw you were supposed to be in some event tonight somewhere. No, it was the morning events. Came back around three or four. So, okay. thank you, sir. Good. Excellent presentation, Doc, and. Um, I listened all through. 
I was taking notes and I just wanted to say thank you. My own question is, is this just supposed to be a one-off section or you had planned to <laughs> to sustain it? <laughs> but, but so much value in one section that as you could um, imagine, an hour is nothing compared to the value that personally I have gleaned from your section. It's something that I always look out for. And I would be honest, Doc, I don't know how to say this, but this has been one of the most incredible years of my life doing business. And I won't use this, but what we've made this year in the last five years put together is nothing compared to what we've achieved between the first seven months. And all of this is because of that right mindset. I've been traveling consistently out of this country for over 12 years. And just like what you acknowledge and you said, it's not about running away from your country. And if you run away with the mindset of looking out for bet greener pastures, you lose it. And I love the example that you gave that if you can't be, if you can't solve problems here, you can't definitely solve problems over there. And there they have a more complex environment. Mm -hmm. Although when I mean more complex, not in terms of their problems, they've they've used system to deal with some of the problems that we are dealing with here, which are the opportunities that we have here to solve. Exactly. And every time I walk into a place, what has helped me is I've already built that growth mindset. I just switch this. this when, I, when people say challenges, I say, what can I learn from this? What are the opportunities in this? And when I ask, I listen to all the answers that come. And it's worked more than one time that I'm continuing to leverage on it. So thank you once again for reinforcing that message and to continue to advocate that we stay here, we be the change that we want, and everything has to do with us. And I thank you. That's just my contribution. Thank you, Doc. All right. Joe. Thank you, Victor. I was just about to say, Victor, and you just rounded it off. Thank you. Okay, there's another question here. Okay, Dr. Sam was on the call. Uh, poor farm, sincerely, yes, God. I, am, I am not answering Sam's question. Sam, <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm oh, not answering no. Sam's question. If Sam Sam has to come on camera, let us see him because I have me to have question how to ask Sam on this call. So wow. I'll ask this question thank, only thank after God. he comes on camera and explains why he's typing his question rather than coming on the call. Okay, uh, yeah. Dr. Sam, I cannot help you here. I'm sorry. You have to come on camera. Uh, oh. Sam, 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 Sam. Is that politics or the truth? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, poor. I'm sincerely bothered. The, the crack in our system has kind of come to stay and most time the international communities have come to appreciate and accommodate our uniqueness. How do we navigate through these complexities and still maintain our commitment to transformation? You know, Sam, um, to answer that question, here's what I need to say. Uh, there's a lot of, since we, there are a lot of, there's a lot of questions in that question. It's loaded, um, for lack of better words. And um, what I will say is this. There is nothing unique about our system or who we are. We created that uniqueness simply because of the way we think. We created that system. We've enforced oh, okay. okay. We created that system simply because of how we think. I, I told someone a while back, I said, let's assume we can trade. Let's assume we can trade. Let's move. Nigeria has about 200 plus million people. Nigeria as a nation has over 200 million people. America as a nation has about 300 million people plus. Let's trade places. Let's move everybody in America into Nigeria and move everybody in Nigeria into America. Swap. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, 50 years 
In fact, 50 years is probably too far. 50 years from now, the same people that went to America will be wanting to go back to Nigeria for vacation. So the location is not the problem. The people are the problem. The environment, the way we think is the problem. The people that we've given the authority and the reins of leadership is part of our problem. And like I said, it's been over 60 years that we have allowed people who are not qualified to be the head of your own family to lead you as a nation. Simply because they have amassed and stolen resources that belong to you. They've taken everything. They're using your own resources to oppress you. They live literally at your own expense. The security forces that are supposed to protect you are their personal security detail. They use your own resources to oppress you. So when is that going to change? That has been 60 years in the making. And here's what I do know. It's going to take about the same amount of time to undo that. And that requires consistency, sir. So there's nothing unique about who we are. We are only unique because we've allowed people who are not smart to lead us. I speak on this call. I see some of you that are politicians. What I know about those of you on this call, you are some of the smartest human beings that I know in Nigeria. But here's the problem. They will not give you the opportunity. Those bosses that you work with will never allow you to enter an office of influence because they know you will make them look stupid. So what do you do? Every opportunity you have, you give it the best you can. That's about all, as much as I know. In order for a nation, let me just say this. In order for a nation like Nigeria to to change. Moses, Daniel, how far now? Thank you. <laughs> In order for certain nations to become constructive, productive, and progressive, certain things must be uprooted, stem, and root. For that to happen in Nigeria, something catastrophic must happen. My question is this, how many Nigerians are ready for that? How many Kenyans are ready for that? Something had to happen in Rwanda for that to happen. What you see today is a price that was paid in 30 days by over a million lives. As sad and as grim as it is, it is what has made it a beacon of light and hope for all of Africa. What price are we willing to pay? So Sam, I, I, I don't have the answer to the problem, but here's what we're doing. We keep allowing people from other countries coming to present a lot of old, archaic, senseless, meaningless opportunities. We just believe that because somebody's skin is lighter than ours, they're smarter than us. No. As a matter of fact, and I'm saying this with all humility, some of the smartest human beings on earth, their skins are darker than mine. The only difference is that they have been obstructed, suppressed, undermined by their leaders, and so they've never had a platform to express themselves. Until that changes, Sam, nothing is going to change. I see a lot of questions. Okay. Yeah, okay, Prof. Um, I think um, Dr. Sam, I think he had a follow-up question. How do young men like us going through the ladder not get compromised because if we must survive, sometimes we are afraid of adaptation because it looks like the only way. How do we navigate through this? You do not adapt. Adaptation simply means you're becoming like them. No. Yes. 
Yes. You just not adapt that. You don't do that. What you do, you sit, you learn the system and wait for the right opportunity. There is absolutely, you see, Paul, there's, they said when you're in Rome, act like the Romans. Act. They didn't say be. When you're in Jerusalem on Israel, be like the Israelites, be like the Jews. You just, you play the game, but you do not lose value and sense of who you are. You get to a time where it's right. You've gotten the influence. You've gotten the resources. You have the notoriety. All the while you've been looking, you know what is right, what is wrong. And when the times comes, you step up and that's it. You do what you got to do. I have a classic example that I'll use to teach, that I'll use, I'll use for you right now. Here's a simple example. A simple example is <laughs> many of you see the drama going on in Nigeria, particularly in a state called River State, between the former governor and the new governor. That is a classic case of a man who humbly sat down, waited for his turn. The same principle. It's not the best. I'm not saying that one is better than the other. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that that is the concept of sitting, serving for your turn. When the time comes, once your time comes in, you can do what you need to do. It is very okay. Nothing wrong with sitting down and being a yes man for 10 years. But when the opportunity comes for you to become the executive and take the reins, you can make a difference when your time is right. Does that answer your question, sir? Awesome. Yeah, Anu, I think I can see your hand raised. Please, can you go ahead? Thank you. When, what does Agbadu say? When all the opportun available opportunities, lessons I got from you, it's it's a learning curve. I don't, I didn't find out about the philosophy and morality of the business owner. The person took multi billions of people's investment. EFCC got involved, but the matter didn't get to the core. Okay, so you're just explaining their situation. It is well. It is well. Um, so let me just say this to just as I was reading through that. Let me just add this so you can think about it. Being a Christian does not mean that you don't have a brain. Hmm? It does not affect your mind. Let me tell you something. If if I'm I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian man. I'm a person of faith. I have never lost money in business in over 30 years of doing business. I have never lost money except to Christians. Why? Because every time I do business with people of my own faith, I just believe that they believe they, tr they have the same degree of integrity and passion and thing for God. And so I, I just I just assume that everything will be okay. So I don't do the degree of due diligence that I would. As a matter of fact, I gave an example that I recently lost. Well, when I say recently, I mean 2015, that I lost $246,000. Now, let me tell you, this is a very interesting thing. I was able to raise over $800,000 for that business. Over $800,000 I raised within 30 days for a specific business. Even though after the business was presented to me, I looked at the whole plan and every alarm in my brain was ringing. This is not right. Something, Everything was going off. But then I had a conversation with my pastor that time. And I said, you know, you are the guy that introduced this guy to do business. You know, these things are not checking out. I, and my pastor said, no, I know him. It's no problem. Just, just. And so I went with the word of my pastor. But thank God I did something. Rather than give this guy almost 900000 that I have raised, I decided to give him about 246, which was about a quarter, close to a quarter of what I've raised and say, you know what, let's start with this first and see how it goes. I thank God I didn't give him the whole thing. <laughs> Imagine. So even though I knew everything was wrong, I had just basically didn't do my due diligence. So now where I am, where I am is this. 
if you ask if i want to do business with you i would i have a template of due diligence that we need to go through and even after we've gone through that if anything in me feels somehow i'm out if 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 you ask me for a loan i don't give loans just for the record i don't give loans if you need money to, if i if if you ask me for 100,000 if all i can dash you is 5,000 i'll give you 5,000 let's all be at peace but that I have to invest the 100000 because it says it's a business. Ah, no, no. Especially if you can't someone. Even my own family, we've gotten to a point where my own blood relatives, we've gotten to a point where if you want to do business, you want to do anything, those days of saying, I'll give you 20K today, 50K tomorrow, 100K today, to do the same business for over 10 years, we're still doing the same business. It, it doesn't make any sense. So it got to a point where I said, okay, even though you are my own brother, you are my own sister, you are my own cousin, Let's go through my business template. You say it's business. Let's be partners in it. I will bring the money. I'll bring the 100K to start the business. You are going to run the business, but we are partners in this so that that way you'll not be chopping the money every Saturday and be thinking it's your own. Even though in my mind, the goal is to empower you and build you up, but I want you to have a sense of responsibility knowing that you have a partner in the business. Are you following what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, you have to, if I, if, where I am right now, any money that I invest in business in a new territory or with a new person or with a new partner, it must be that it is money that I'm willing to lose. If I'm not afraid, if I, if I can't afford to lose that money, I will never invest it. That's just my own experience and I'm okay with it. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, bro. Thank you so much. I appreciate much. Yes, Anu, please can you go ahead? Kemi, we've got to round up yeah. this few hours, so let's wait, 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 wait. Which Anu is this? Anu that I have. Well, the same. Oh, yes, the same Anu. <laughs> the same Anu. Oh my God! Hello, Doctor Dala. It's been a while. It's been quite a quite a while. Ask your question, uh, sir. Is, okay, so I I I just wanted to um first and foremost just say hi, and of course I picked up a point there. Um, that I would also like to reiterate very briefly. I think it's important that we um, we uh, invent systems for ourselves, just like you said, that will protect ourselves because we don't have that kind of um, uh, privilege, you know, with the government. But for me, I just want you to go back to the same question that um, the other guy asked earlier. Um, is this going to be a one-off or is something that um, has come to stay and is going to be, um, so that we could look forward to it because um, I think it's been a while. Interestingly, I was still mentioning to, you know, one of the persons that I have the privilege to influence recently about how you've actually positively impacted me personally, you know, many years back. And um, believe me, from then up until now, um, the difference is, is, is amazing, sincerely. And uh, I know that I didn't really scratch, you know, too too deep, uh, you know, into into the knowledge base. Uh, but even with the little that I was able to get, it was quite it was quite impactful. So, are we going to still have this session again um, going forward from, you know, more frequently, or is just a one off like, um, you yes, know, like we're pay. having today? You will pay. You have to pay. Thank. You. You know, Kemi, calm down. Kemi, calm down. Kemi, calm down. Calm down. <laughs> um, mm, okay. Well, today's meeting was um, a one off, and I have to be very, very, um, I have to be very intentional about my time. Um, for most of you who, like I'm looking at the names, yeah, I can't tell everybody, but so let's do something interesting. If if you've ever attended a PTN, PTNX, or retreat with PTN or whatever it is, if you've ever done that, just identify yourself in the in in the chat so that at least we see how many of you. And not just identify yourself, but put which year, which year you attended, which year. Which year did you attend? Just just say which year and in what city. I have a reason for asking that. So please do that while I address this question. Now, here's the thing. Um, time. Time and audience is important. 
if I have to speak to a general, there's a reason why I don't do churches anymore. I don't speak on church platforms anymore very intentionally because half the time, um, most of the people listen to you with their emotions rather with their minds. Um, and developing a transformational mindset takes time. Some of you have been with me since 2017 when we started PTN in Nigeria. We spent that time crisscrossing the nation, having meetings everywhere, um, teaching, having retreats. And what you don't understand is being part of this transformative journey comes at a price. And when we say a price, the price I'm talking about is not just on your end. It's also on mine. Every retreat that I have with any group of people costs me time, costs me money, costs me a lot of things. At the end of the day, what I'm looking for is the value and the outcome. Now, I can sit down on a call like this and listen to testaments from people like Victor talking about how his business has, you know, has taken off. I can listen and see people like Femi, Fumi, so, um, Kemi, I'm sorry. Um, I see people like Raf, who um, is doing some amazing work with young technologists and uh, all that type of work. I see people like Sam, um, even yourself, um, even you, like, um, um, you know, um, you know, Shagun, someone. Um. Anu, I, I'm looking, I'm like, I know I don't call him Shegun. There's another name. It's Anu. Yes, good. You know, and so many of you, I see some of you on this call who no longer live in Nigeria. I see some UK people. I see some Canada people all on the call. And the reason why you're still here is because of the value that you've gained over time. Now, if, show me that you're serious. You show me that you're serious and I'll make the time. PTN did not disappear. As a matter of fact, what happened to PTN was that since 2019 was that we did have three, we have three categories or three groups in PTN. There is the general group, there's the retreat group, and then there's the PTNX group. That has been the only group I've been spending my time with. Those individuals who succeeded and completed the training at PTNX have entered into a small group that is called um, that I deem to be a lifetime mentoring or mentorship group. Those are the people who can call me at three o'clock in the morning and have questions and I'll come. As a matter of fact, it is that group that asks for this event today. And they said, can you please open it up to every other person besides just us? And that's why we're doing this. Um, why? Because they've paid the price. They've paid the price to be worthy of my time. I am not the most influential person. I am not the smartest person. I am not um, any one of those things. I am not the wealthiest. I am not, I'm a very simple person. But the one thing about me is that my time is very valuable to me. I don't care how you see my time, but it is valuable to me. And I protect my time with everything within my being. So here's what I will say. This is going to be our true test if we should continue this or not. Today is August 31st. I will leave it to you all. I will leave it all, I will leave it to all of you, particularly those of you in this group, however way you want to make it work. If you think it is worthy of having sessions like this once a month for the next, I can we can do a trial run. <laughs> we can do a trial run for the next three, four months and see how it goes. Um, you come up with the topics that you want to talk about or the things that matter to you because this is one off does not help your ministry much. It will give you information. You have to go build on it and work on it. And then let's see how it goes for the next few months. And if everything pans out well, say for September, October, November, three months, let's do a three month trial run. Once a month, the last Saturday of the month. If we can make that work about the same time, if we can make that work for the next three months and it makes sense, here is going to be my commitment to you. My commitment will be that I will be coming to your countries to help you build. 
It doesn't matter if you're in Rwanda, if you're in Kenya, you're in Nigeria, you're in which other countries am I saying here? Um, Tanzania, doesn't matter. If you want to put an event together, we will. But know that at the end of the day, once it's built up, you would have to run with it because I can't be in two places at the same time. Is that a fair, is that a fair compromise? Yeah, I think if it's Anu, Okay, guess probably is a... Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. So we can commit to two hours every month for the next three months. Last Saturday of the month, same time. Kemi, if you all can arrange that, I'll let you all handle all the arrangement and all of that. All right, Prof. Always a pleasure to be at your service and the service of everyone. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've had um, a good time of both. If it was a fiscal event, I would have said we should sing the bo, 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 busa. But Prof promised he was going to give one hour, but um, now we have two hours that he, we had two hours that he had given for free. Thank you so much, Prof. Is always a good time listening to you. I think we have been fully recharged. Our minds have been opened again. And um, thank you for being magnanimous also for giving at least throughout the end of the year, 2024, we can, you can watch us grow more from lava to butterfly. Thank you so very much on behalf of everyone on the call. We really, really, really appreciate you, sir. <laughs> and, and somebody is saying, the just, white game just, just giving prof vibes. Just, just I needed to say that it's just, Charles that said it by the way. Just so thank Charles. you very much, prof. Just ignore Charles. Have, <laughs> thank you very much, prof. We appreciate you, and we look forward to meeting you again at the end of next month. You're all very welcome, and um, I wish you all the best. All I can tell you is that don't lose hope. Um, keep working on yourselves, okay? There's there's nothing else I can tell you. You can have all the principles, but if you don't apply it, um, nothing is going to change. Celebrate little successes. Little successes. Celebrate little successes one step at a time. Okay? It was nice meeting all of you, Kemi. Yes, Prof. Thank you so very much, everyone. Prof, have a lovely night rest. We'll okay. keep in touch. All right, sounds Thank good. you, Prof. Thank, thank you, thank you everyone. We love you. We love you plenty. <laughs>